Hello, everybody. We had a couple of minor technical glitches here, but nothing major. So we're going to get started in just a second. Um, I'd like you to be ready for a participatory workshop more than just webinar where you're being talked at. And I'd like you to spend the next minute moving. Okay, you can jog in place, march in place, do jumping jacks, starting now. Push-ups, jump rope, dance, but move, as long as you're not in an open office. And who's in an open office these days, right? So keep moving. Um, again, I want you to be ready for a participatory webinar because that's exactly what Alicia has planned. You, and when you finish this moment of movement, I also have a favor to ask of you. And that is that you tell your friends who are applying to medical school about the webinar because we still have room for your friends today in the, in the webinar. Okay, so I'm going to chat you. Give me one second. And keep moving. Keep moving. Don't give it up. I'm going to chat you um, a URL that you can share with your friends. After you stop mo moving. And keep going, you got another few seconds left. And then you can share it with your friends. Um, we've had a really good response to this webinar, but I still think we have room for your friends. So, okay, the moment of motion is up. We're gonna start in just a couple of seconds. And the URL that you can share with your friends, social media, text, whatever works, is um, right there, okay? All right, my name is Linda Abraham and I am the president of Accepted and the moderator for today's webinar. I want to welcome all of you to create a winning MCAS application to be presented by Alicia McNeese de Moncar. Before we start, I have a few items for you to keep in mind. If you've not let, yet downloaded and printed out your worksheet for today's webinar, I invite you to do so now. And again, I'm going to send it to you via the chat window. So here we go. There, okay, that's, um, there you go, okay. I think it'll help you follow along, take notes, and just get the most hour or so. Now, Alicia is going to ask several questions during the presentation and also ask you to raise your hand in response. You can do so by clicking on the hand icon, which is on your control panel. Um, right now, let's practice this. If you want to go to medical school in order to pursue your dream career, please raise your hand. In other words, click on that hand icon. Okay, well, most of you are here for the right reasons, and yes, okay, perfect. Thank you so much. Okay, and figured out how to click, raise, click that icon. Great, good, very good. Last point, when you re leave, you're going to re receive a brief survey. Please, please fill it out. We value your feedback. And, and we use it. I've, I always look at the feedback and use it to determine what we're going to keep, what we're going to change. Oh, and one more thing before I introduce Alicia. I've been told that webinar attendees sometimes are so curious about the special offer that we occasionally offer at the end. We don't do it all the time, that they forget to pay attention to the content. I don't want that to happen to you. Therefore, here is the offer. 10% um, off all non-rush med surface services the coupon code is start now, because that's what you should be doing with your med school application. And the page to go to is accepted.com slash primary. This special offer ends May 4th, which is next Monday. Now this will be, um, this, this sale is actually going to be announced on the site tomorrow, but you folks get it for an extra day. The coupon code is start now, and I'll repeat it at the end of the webinar, but you are the early bird, you arrived early and you now know. Finally, I'm thrilled to introduce Alicia McNeese de Moncar, who will present Create a Winning MCAS application today. Alicia started advising Acceptance clients in 2012. She immediately was earning rave reviews from clients and has been earning them ever since. Prior to joining Accepted, she both evaluated applications and advised med school applicants as director of the UC Davis post -Bac program. She brings enormous insight and experience with the medical school application process to our webinar today. Without further ado, Alicia McNeese Namankar and create a winning MCAS application. Well, I'm going to start by asking you a couple of questions. Um, first, how many people have applied to medical school? If you can please give us a show of hands. Oh, a lot of them. Okay, about 
15, 17 percent. A lot of a lot of hands raised though. Ten, yeah. 15, 17 okay, percent. Awesome. Like that. Thank you. So the next question I have is a poll. Goodness. So you'll see a little window pop up, and you can vote. Um, for those of you who have applied, what sections of the AMCAS application did you have the most difficulty completing? And the options are the personal statement, the activities sections, essays, um, or the statement of disadvantage. Again, for those of you who have applied, what sections of the MCAS application do you have the most difficulty completing? And the options are the personal statement, the activity section essays, or the statement of disadvantage. And the responses are still coming in. The personal, what was the hardest for you? Okay, this is obviously only people who've already applied. So I'm going to end the polling now. Five, four, three, two, one. And about, I'm assuming about 35% of our visitors have, um, have re are reapplicants. Re That's what percentage participated. 58% of them said the personal statement was the hardest. 35% hardest. said the activity um, section was the hardest. And 8% said the statement of disadvantage was the hardest. So again, it's okay. personal statement is the overwhelming winner here. Yeah, okay. So thank you for, um, for voting. So this webinar is one of my favorites, and it's because of your participation. So please, every time I ask a question or have a poll, please participate. Um, and I agree, the personal statement can be the most difficult part. In fact, we could probably do a whole webinar just on the personal statement, couldn't we, Linda? Probably. I think we have. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, pretty, it's pretty tricky to get that part of the application right. So I want to thank all of you for joining me today from a safe distance, and I hope you are all staying safe and healthy. Um, and I want to thank you for having the courage and the willingness to go into a profession that requires such dedication and bravery, especially at this time. So thank you. So today we're going to do an AMCAS workshop. So why is this helpful? Well, we want to help you determine your location in the labyrinth of medical school admissions. We want to encourage you to self-reflect, to assess your strengths and your weaknesses. And we ultimately want you to end up with a strategy. But you have to have a destination in mind, or you will never reach a specific location. It's like being lost in a labyrinth. And for those of you who are reapplicants, you know exactly what I mean, <laughs> right? Getting stuck in secondaries or getting stuck on any part of the application can be really frustrating. So hopefully these strategies will help you move smoothly through the process. So let's start with the most difficult section, the personal statement. So for those of you listening, why is this section so hard? Why don't you answer the question? You can answer the question in the chat window. Why, in the chat window, please, why do you find the personal statement so difficult for those of you? I have no clue what to write about, is the answer. From Cody, yeah. anybody <laughs> else want to share? Is this live? Yes, it is live. <laughs> Unsure what to focus on? I feel like I'm not unique enough. I'm live. Unsure, uh, unsure what to focus on. Trying to fit a lot into 5,300 50, characters. It's hard to write what you really want while also thinking about probably what the admissions committee wants to hear. Yeah. <laughs> Not sure how to present myself optimally. I have no idea. And the answer is we have a really active group here today. I feel pressure to make an impact, highlighting only a few experiences slash reasons. That's from Shelley. It's hard to write about yourself. Let's keep it appealing. Have all parts like intro, body, and conclusion. Yep. It's hard to balance the reason you want to be a doctor with your experience and skills. Being confident versus being confident, cocky, excellent. These are all very real problems when you're writing a personal statement. It's hard to figure out where to begin, also what to include and not include. Don't know so how to sell are, myself without bragging. It's real excellent. Yeah, these are excellent um, contributions. And there, is, there are some common themes. So a lot of people are talking about how difficult it is to know what to write. So content can be confusing. Um, especially when it's hard to identify in yourself what is unique. Um, so what I'd recommend, honestly, in my experience, the introduction 
is usually the most difficult part of the personal statement. And often I'll have students come up with a list of 10, 15 different possible introductions because it's really all about coming up with as many ideas as you can because to make the best choice, to choose the best introduction for you, you have to know what all the options are, right? If you just choose the first thing that comes to mind, that could end up being really haphazard and not represent you well. But if you sit down and as a brainstorming fun activity, say, hey, what are 10, 15 possible ways I could introduce myself to a selection committee? And it could be creative. I've had somebody write a personal statement about peanut butter and jelly sandwiches for their intro. And it ended up being hilarious and brilliant. And it ended up being a metaphor. Um, and he connected it to food, to culture, and to health. And it was this incredible theme that he really beautifully developed. And even talked about volunteering in India and the food they ate there and connections between food and health and his interest in medicine. So you can take something as, silly as peanut butter and jelly sandwiches and connect it to medicine. Um, you could do dance, you could do anything. The important thing is that it represents you. And my goal is for the students I work with that their personal statements are completely unique. No one's personal statement should ever sound like somebody else's. So this is why I don't recommend um, that students read a lot of samples of personal statements or other people's personal statements. Um, because what somebody does in their statement might not work, will probably not work for you, and you want to have your own unique approach. So knowing what to write. So once you figure out your introduction, that will help you outline your themes. And once you've got themes in mind, right, then you can start more carefully selecting content that will be strategic, right, ideas that will um, connect possibly I was working with someone on a personal statement today that has a theme of leadership. And as she was looking back through her life, she was realizing that she has so many examples from early on and, and um, that she pursued leadership opportunities specifically um, for, for how she could develop her um, communication skills, her ability to delegate, her ability to um, improve things with a group of people. And so um, taking the time to really look at what are all your options? What are all the possible ways you could introduce yourself? Um, and it takes 10 ideas to get to one really good idea. And when you find that idea, you're going to know it because you're going to get really excited to write that personal statement. Right? When you find that unique angle that nobody else is going to have, covering it from your perspective, um, you're going to get really excited. And, it, and the rest of your outline is going to come together really quickly. Um, so it takes time to write a really strong personal statement. It takes time. So make sure you give yourself enough time. It can be difficult, as everyone has said, to know what to include. So again, brainstorming. Um, I, I just recently watched a master class, as you probably are all as well. Um, and this brilliant, brilliant person said, ideas are everything. I just love that because it's so true. So take the time right, to really look at uh, what are all the possible ways you could approach this. What are all the possible ideas you could have um, to approach this? The best personal statements, in my experience, have a really nice balance of personal and professional information. So for those of you listening, why would it be important to maintain a balance between personal and professional information? In the in chat window, please. Let's see. Balancing personal influence versus professional influence. Um, and why do you want to be, that's a little earlier. Let's see. Anybody have an idea on that one? I got, I got quiet now. Uh, here we go. Demonstrate both emotional <laughs> investment, value, alignment, and then tangible experience. Okay. Done to not disclose too much about yourself, to show your interests, but also who you actually are. Very good, Maddie. Show maturity so they can see how qualified you are plus who you are. Good. To demonstrate a more holistic person. 
Yeah, these are brilliant. You get it. You totally get it. Um, it's about letting them see who you are as a person, but also that you are qualified, that you are um, ready for this profession. Um, yeah, these are brilliant responses. Um, if you are too personal, someone mentioned, if you share too much personal information, you can make the reader really uncomfortable, right? It's possible to make someone squirm when they read your personal statement. And the best example I have of that, and I'll never forget this, I'll never forget it made, the way it made me feel to read this personal statement. A student um, was in uh, an abusive relationship, and she wrote about um, how her partner had tried to murder her. And you when you read this personal statement, you completely forgot that she was applying to medical school, right? You immediately were concerned about her safety. Was she okay? Um, was she in a bad situation? Did she need help? And because the information she shared was too personal, it completely detracted from her purpose, which was to introduce herself and to explain her qualifications. It's also possible to be too professional. Um, the best example I have of this one, and I'll never forget this one either, um, a student wrote about how much she enjoyed dissecting mice um, to remove their brains for a study, for a research project. And while I understood that she was intellectually challenged and curious about this um, project, the way that she wrote without any compassion um, for the animals about dissecting them was really creepy, <laughs> like really creepy. And obviously, we didn't invite her to interview, <laughs> right? It was a little too creepy. Um, it's also possible to come across as sort of flat, um, robotic, if you're too professional. Um, and it's very easy to reject someone if you think, they're a robot. <laughs> so, right, you don't want to be too personal. You don't want to share your own personal medical history. Um, and you also don't want to not share anything about yourself um, professionally and personally. You know, only focusing on your academic qualifications also won't cut it. So, what are some ways that you all plan to approach this task successfully? Let's see. In, so what the, are some... in the chat window, tell a story, says D. Great way. Weave in anecdotes and reflection from Elaine. Use a mind map to brainstorm. Good. I sometimes use mind maps, Cindy. Yeah, these are great. So often outlines, I feel that outlines are really um, one of the easiest ways to set yourself up for success when writing your personal statement. That was the next um, you one. You wouldn't build up. What's that? That was the next one that came through. Yeah. So I wouldn't, you, right, you wouldn't try to build a house without a blueprint, <laughs> right, if that house probably wouldn't stand. So taking the time to look at what are all the options that are coming up with ideas, playing with those ideas, putting those ideas in one order, putting them in another order, Right. Outlines allow you to think through an essay before you take the trouble to write it. So it really is, it can be a fun, creative endeavor, and it will really help you self-reflect, right, if done uh, correctly. Also, giving yourself time for editing. So planning on having multiple drafts. Multiple drafts are really important. You don't want to um, only write one draft and send that off, you know, submit it um, with your application. Um, most writing benefits from multiple drafts. Giving yourself time to take a break and reviewing each draft um, with fresh eyes. So if you're looking at a draft every day for two weeks, it gets really difficult to see what areas need revision, what areas are rough, um, and another tip I can give you is read your draft out loud. And that really helps. Read your draft out loud and or have somebody else read your draft out loud to you. 
Right? That can be an easy way to get a new perspective on your writing. I would say that the best personal statements are authentic and honest depictions of your real motivations for going into medicine. And this is often a focus on subtleties, like the Mona Lisa. Right? So your own statement can be um, a masterpiece, a culmination of your experiences and emotional maturation. So give yourself the time and play with all the possibilities. Next, we're going to talk about the activity section. So for this section, I don't want you to reinvent the wheel, right? So start with your resume or CV. And it's a good idea to update your resume and CV as often as possible, right? Every time you do something new, add it to your resume. <laughs> Easy way to keep track of everything you've done. Filling out the activity section can be a time-consuming task because you have space on the AMCAS application to list 15 activities, right? You want to break it down into sections. So I recommend writing anywhere from three to five activities a day. You'll end up with much better quality writing if you do that. If you try to write all 15 in one day, I can tell you, A, it's not fun. <laughs> B, it's probably not going to be your best writing by the 15th description. And this is a great way to increase your stamina in preparation for your secondary application. Because if you think about it, secondary applications have anywhere from one super long essay to maybe you know eight, 10 short essays. So give yourself a chance to build up your stamina. So for those of you listening, did you have any questions about what activities to include or not include in this section? If you do have questions, please post them in the question window. Any questions on what Alicia has to say? You can also ask questions at the end, by the way. We're going to have a Q&A at the end. So somebody's asking, are you serious about listing all 15? And like another one here, do we have to fill out all 15? <laughs> Did somebody say, are you serious? <laughs> yes. <laughs> I love this. <laughs> That's hilarious. Um, yeah, so, okay, this will shock you, but um, you want to use all 15. It can actually lead to a rejection for you to use any less than 15. Because if you think about um, your competition, most students are including two or three activities within one description just to fit everything they've done. And I have some bad news for, um, for you. <laughs> um, the ACOMAS, if you're planning on applying to osteopathic medical schools, there's no limit to the number of activities you can include. <laughs> so. so the good news is the limit, huh? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so it is good news that there are only 15 required for yeah. the AMCAS application. Yeah. yeah. We have a lot of other, other questions on this. What about experiences that are not <laughs> medically related, like customer service, for example? This is from Kyle. Oh, those are fantastic. Actually, customer service, is, is definitely related to medicine. Um, as a doctor, right, you always have to check in and make sure your patients are happy with the care you're providing, that you're listening to them, that you understand. Um, part, a big part of medicine is customer service, wouldn't you say, Linda? Right, of course. Absolutely. Yeah. You're interacting with I the mean, public. and say? it's Service, service is, the, is the essence of medicine. It's the yeah. heart of it. So believe it or not, probably all of your activities in some shape or form are definitely connected to medicine. Okay. Um, and I'm gonna, we're gonna, we have a lot of questions on this and I'm gonna, we can always get back to them at the end. Um, another, another really good question is, what if an activity got cut short because of COVID-19? I started a research project in March and it got postponed until the fall. Well, first of all, I'm so sorry. That's frustrating. And second, you are not alone. Oh, Every gosh, no. single person <laughs> is dealing with the same thing. And there are many ways you can continue to build on your activity sections, even though you know, we're in quarantine. Um, you know, you, right now, parents are desperate <laughs> for help. 
homeschooling their kids, and tutoring companies are hiring like crazy. There are nonprofits who are desperately looking for people to volunteer for families who can't afford tutoring companies. Um, you can volunteer to read stories to the elderly. Uh, there are so many things you can do. Um, whatever you're interested in, there are definitely opportunities. I have a student who's helping to build an app to get accurate information out to the public about COVID-19. Um, there are so many um, possibilities. Some people are sewing masks. I'm sewing masks in my free time. Um, there are Whatever your skills are, whatever your interests are, you can definitely continue building in your activity section now. Okay, I think we should move on. There are a lot of questions coming in, but we're going to circle back to a lot of them also. Yeah, okay, so at the end we will cover more. Um, so I would say for the activity section, you want to have a good balance. Um, again, that word balance, right? So mm -hmm. you want to balance leadership, volunteer, clinical, with your personal talents and hobbies. Obviously, <laughs> there should be more leadership, volunteer, clinical, than talents or hobbies. You want to have really like one or two talents or hobbies on your application, and maybe they're combined, unless you've won awards or you've, you know, for example, if you won an art competition or you wrote a, got, won a short story comp contest, right? Um, Maybe it would be two things if one was a lifelong pursuit that you've reached a high level of expertise in. Um, but most likely you'll have like one activity as hobbies and you'll just describe them all together. Um, but most of your experiences, right, will be clinical, will be volunteer. You'll have some leadership. Um, you've got to have some leadership. And then, you know, like one talent or hobbies combined. Um, you could also have an awards and honors, and I would recommend combining those all under one activity. And that would include scholarships, um, like employee of the month, you know, any honors or awards, any type you've received. And you want to make sure you only include activities during college and after. The only exception to that is if you started an activity in high school and you continued that through college, like with the same organization, um, right? There's gotta be some kind of connection. So for those of you listening, can you give me examples of each of these that you will include in your application? In the chat window, please. In the chat window, what would be some examples? In the meantime, somebody posed a question while they're writing, you can, um, Actually, there's two questions. What are some examples of leadership and what kind of things can possibly be put under leadership? So, yeah, yeah. So we get this question probably every time we do this webinar. Leadership can be represented across multiple different forms. So being a mentor for big brother, big sister, and that's something you could do now remotely, um, that would be um, leadership. Teaching would be leadership, and right, you could do that as a tutor. You could do that electronically, right, by volunteering for a nonprofit. Or um, if you need to earn income, you could apply to tutor through a tutoring company. Um, there are many different forms of leadership. Any kind of, um, you know, stu a peer advisor. If you were a peer advisor, right? Um, that yeah, there's so many types of leadership. So we have your Sunday school teacher. Um, RA and residential, like residence, resident assistant, you know, in, in the dorms, um, varsity national team athletics. I would say, especially if you were a captain. Um, yeah. Leadership musical section leader, volunteer group leader, director. This is from Amanda. Would you say that's leadership? I would. Definitely. Such yeah. as I am the the, vi the vice president of my professional organization. Yeah. Fantastic. Uh, Vice President of Philanthropy, Service Chair, Tutoring High School Students. Yeah, absolutely. Starting a medical clinic, right? Absolutely. Founder, yep, founder is a leadership position. Absolutely. Organizer of the club for pre-med, working as a practice manager in a medical dental office with a team of nine. Totally. <laughs> um, yeah. Pole Volve Coaching, <laughs> that's a new one, <laughs> okay. Ooh, that's, yeah, I've never seen that one before. Very cool. Right, right. 
I served in Afghanistan before attending college. I worked with a trauma unit and I volunteered to assist the medical staff with trauma patients. Could that be listed toward clinical experience? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yes, it's not leadership, well, but yeah. it's not certainly leadership at least. Um, I'm not sure if this is leadership. It is, it is again, clinical. We're, we're focusing on leadership now. Okay, I think, again, I, there are more questions, but um, let's, let's come back to them. Now, uh, somebody here, nomination for President's Award. I'm gonna guess that what got you the nomination is more an example of leadership than just getting the award. Would, would you agree with yeah. that? Yeah. yeah, most definitely, yeah. And that's why when you're mapping out your activity section, again, I think it's a great idea to make a short list, to look at, okay, you've got 15 spots. How are you, you going to use that space most strategically? How are you going to um, make yourself um, as balanced and individual as possible? And there are things you can be doing now, right? If you've got mostly clinical at this point, maybe you need some more volunteer experience. Maybe you need some more leadership. Um, and there are definitely ways that you can be gaining that experience now to make your application as strategic as possible and as balanced as possible. Um, okay, so now we're gonna talk about the most meaningful essays. So for those of you listening, what is the difference between the activity description and the most meaningful essays? In the chat window, please. More character count, says Elaine. Which has the more character count? The MMEs. Expanded description. <laughs> um, that's right. Expanded description in obviously the most meaningful essays. <clears throat> most meaningful is the one that you, for you to expand on the experience and what you've learned more extensively. You get three MMEs, you have many more activity descriptions. You can choose the three most meaningful. It's from different people. What if you write your personal statement about your most meaningful experience? That's a problem. Um, <laughs> I might come back to that later. Yeah. Put that, put that in the question window if you could, because I think that is something to come back to later. Um, you put three experiences that mean the most to you and expand on them about why they impacted you. More detail. MME is more... Hello? I agree with that. That's from Jonathan. Yes, that's from Jonathan. MME is more about a story and less facts. You there? Yeah. Yeah. I'm sorry. It cut out for a moment. Um, yeah, I think yeah, we're so having some issues. Yeah, every, every uh, thing you guys are sharing is accurate. So there's good and bad news, right? <laughs> so the good news is there are only three most meaningful essays. Um, the bad news is for each of those that you select as, as your most meaningful, you'll have two essays to complete. So for all 15 activities, you'll write a description that's 700 characters, which is a very short paragraph, don't stress. And the most meaningful essays are 1,325 characters, so almost twice the length. Um, so luckily you only have three of those additional essays, but for the most meaningful, you will write both the activity description, as well as the most meaningful essay. And for your activity descriptions, you want to make sure you cover, right, what is the organization or company. Even if it's a hospital you're volunteering at, you want to say, is this a, a level one trauma hospital, you know, in such and such community, right? You want to give details um, about what's unique about the hospital. Is it the location? Is it, um, you know, the type of patients you treat? Um, is the language predominantly spoken in that area? Um, make sure you give details um, that explain um, what the organization, company, um, or location is about. Also, you want to talk about what your responsibilities are. Um, and for the most meaningful essays, you want to focus on those things that you learned and how the activity impacted your life or career goals as well as how you impacted the community you worked with. Um, so maybe both of those things happened or maybe only one. So to come up with more ideas for the most meaningful essays, again, it's going to be about brainstorming, coming up with ideas. 
and give yourself the time, right, to come up with as many ideas as you can so you can choose just the best one. Journaling. Um, one of the best things you can do to warm up before you have to do your application writing is writing in your journal or your diary to get yourself all warmed up and thinking. Um, give yourself time to reflect is an important thing to do. And to think deeply about why these activities were so meaningful. Why did you choose them? What were you looking for? What were you looking to get out of them? And then what did you end up getting out of them? Those are really interesting questions to think about. Also, maybe going back through old journal entries to see what you wrote about those experiences. Um, for example, if you went on a medical mission somewhere. Um, also, you can go, through back, go back through your um, social media posts to see if there were pictures or comments or experiences you shared um, that might jog your memory about it. And talking to friends and family, um, what they remember about those experiences and what you said about them. So the way that the most meaningful essays are different from the personal statements is that the activities in the activities section should be covered more from a, what was the organization or company, what were your responsibilities, what did you learn. It's really more focused on what you did, how you did it, how you impacted the community you worked with, and or how did that experience impact you. And the personal statement, as somebody mentioned earlier, right? you want to tell more of a story. Um, you want it to flow. Um, and you don't want to list too many different activities in your personal statement. Otherwise, and I saw a statement like this yesterday, a draft, otherwise you're just copying the activity section in your personal statement. If you list, you know, talk about five different activities in your personal statement, that's too many. You're basically duplicating the activity section. So my advice would be to cover no more than one, two, maximum three activities in the personal statement. Otherwise, you know, you run the risk um, of just duplicating the activity section. So you want to cover those things in such detail, right, that you really won't need to cover more than one, two, no more than three activities in the personal statement. So for those of you listening, are there any other ways that you plan to come up with more ideas for your most meaningful essay? How about attending personal development seminars? Is that a good, well, that's more about, is it a good meaning, uh, meaningful essay? It could be. Could be. I think we should move on, okay? Because it's running yeah. on. Yeah, okay, let's move okay. on. All right, so now we're going to talk about the statement of disadvantage. So there are three different types of disadvantage. Social, economic, educational, and I'll give you examples for each one. Social disadvantage would be if you were treated differently due to race, ethnicity, language, religion, sexuality, or any other reason. Um, economic disadvantage would be if your family, um, your family's income was below the poverty level, and your family relied on food stamps or lived in Section 8 housing at any time. Um, an educational disadvantage would be if you attended low-performing public schools um, and, and or if you have a learning disability, for example. Um, so if you have experienced any of these forms of disadvantage at any time in your life, you can apply as a disadvantaged applicant. Will anyone be completing this section? If you could please give me a show of hands. Uh, hands are going up. Okay, about 15%. A little okay, more than that. excellent. Okay. So it will only help you if it is appropriate for you to apply as disadvantaged, to apply as disadvantaged to medical school. It will only help you. So to complete this section, you want to just state the facts. You want the tone to be you know, factual, just state the facts. Um, you don't want to give opinions. You don't want to tell a story here. Um, it's just about stating the facts. You don't want to copy paste from this section in any other part of the application. And sometimes it's not appropriate to apply as disadvantaged. And the examples I can give would be 
if your parents divorced when you were growing up, but it had no other impact on you besides living in two different households. However, if your parents divorced and then you were raised in a single parent household and your mom's income was both below the poverty level, if you relied on food stamps for a time period, um, right, then it would be appropriate to apply as disadvantaged. Also, in my experience, um, I don't think it's a good idea to apply as disadvantaged if the only challenge has been a learning disability. So that seems to also not be as successful. So something like, you know, a divorce but no other impact, um, having a learning disability um, but no other um, forms of disadvantage, uh, those are the two I wouldn't really recommend applying with unless, you know, there are more than one. Um, any questions about this section? We see. What about recent immigration? Would it be a disadvantage as, as well? Yes. Um, mostly, you know, if your family struggled financially, if um, there were time periods when, when um, your family went without jobs, um, if you were ever, um, ever received public assistance. So receiving something like food stamps or any form of public assistance, that provides evidence that your family was in need um, so you want to state any details like that because it will help your application. And Shelley asks, um, attended low-performing school. Which details would you state about the school? In other words, how can you provide evidence that it really was a low-performing school? Yeah, you can actually look up online like um, how, um, how your community is designated. So you can look and see, um, you know, if your county or your area designated a medically underserved area. Or you can look up, um, you know, whether it's considered a, a low-performing public school um, system. You, know, there's, you can definitely look that information up. What about childhood il illness? Um, not by itself. You know, if there were other factors, most certainly, for example, if you had a childhood illness and your family did not have health insurance, and you relied on free clinics for your treatment, then it would be totally appropriate. Um, D asks, what about growing up in a third world country? Most definitely. I mean, just stating the facts of, you know, if, if you did not have access to water, electricity, um, if you had to walk uh, five miles to school, um, you know, every day, um, yeah. There are certainly conditions um, in which it would be appropriate to apply as disadvantage if, if you grew up in a third world country. Okay, and then um, let's do this one. Is no, this one is is race a disadvantage? Um, can you repeat that? Is race a disadvantage? That's an interesting question. So it's complex, right? Yeah. Um, because institutional racism absolutely exists, and we're especially seeing that during the COVID-19 response, unfortunately. Um, but it depends. So race by itself, it wouldn't be appropriate to apply this advantage just based on race. However, if due to, um, and it's usually ethnicity is the term used, there's only one race, the human race, <laughs> right? <laughs> so the term that is... Um, most used in the medical world is ethnicity um, for that reason. And there's some great books on the topic. Um, so I would say by itself, no. However, if, for example, you were not given the same opportunities, if you were treated differently by your um, high school counselor, for example, if you were not even advised to apply to college, if you weren't given the same access to resources to apply to college, um, if you weren't given access to the same opportunities, leadership opportunities, experiences. But that's the tricky thing about racism, right? It's hard to prove those things. And you don't want to have a negative tone in your application. It's really tricky. So you want to state the facts of what occurred, um, but you also want to make sure that you know, it's, there's evidence in one or more areas that would help support um, you applying as disadvantaged. And then we have a couple of questions, and then I think we should move on. 
Are you allowed to apply as disadvantage if you came from a tumultuous household, the domestic violence, but not necessarily under the poverty level? Somebody else is asking about an abusive household. Is that considered disadvantage? Yeah, I'm so sorry that you had that experience. Yeah. Um, but I, I promise you it will make you a better healthcare provider. You're going to be more sensitive. You're going to be more aware of when other people are going through something similar. Um, it will make you a better doctor. Um, so, yes, you can apply as disadvantaged if there was um, abuse or um, neglect in your background, absolutely. Okay. Should we move on? Yeah. And again, you know, you're heroic for making it this far in your education. Um, yeah. So just state the facts of, of what occurred. Yeah. All right. Coursework. Um, for this part of the application, you want to give yourself lots of time. So for those of you who are reapplicants, how long did it take to complete this section? In the chat window, please. I love to hear your responses to this. <laughs> Two to three hours, says Elaine. Okay, impressive. That's pretty fast, actually. Four, says yeah, Kimberly. Three-ish hours, says Carly. Somebody else wow. just wrote a long time with long in all caps. <laughs> Lauren says days. <laughs> Amelia says two yeah. days. Mary says a couple of boring afternoons. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Hey, this, is probably the the worst, this is probably the worst part of the application, wouldn't you say, Linda? Yeah. <laughs> the coursework. It feels I've, I've had so many students get angry about it because they're like, don't they have my transcripts? <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> like, why am I entering all this stuff in? But the reason they do that is to create a GPA calculation for everyone, right, according to their, their system. So it's the, the way the GPAs are calculated across different campuses are different, right? Some schools um, have great forgiveness. Um, some schools will only forgive the first three FRDs and no more. And so they all have slightly different ways they calculate the GPA. So this is a way for them to have a standard um, calculation to, to compare everyone across. Um, so pacing is critical, as you guys know, for this part of the application. Um, give yourself a little time every day to get this done. I don't recommend saving this to the end. You know, if you're really stressed out about getting the application submitted, it's easy to make silly mistakes. So make sure like you enter in a little bit every day, double check what you've entered before you start entering new information. Um, that's an easy way to make sure you don't make mistakes. And for those of you who've already done this before, um, what kinds of issues did you come across when working on this part of the application? Okay, so what kind of, see so somebody, somebody already wrote that um, she finished it in a couple of hours but then found errors each day afterwards. Yeah. <laughs> Which can be pretty aggravating. Yeah. Um, yep. And she asks, how can you include independent coursework? I've completed self-learning programs from Harvard X and language learning platforms. Ooh, that's tricky. Tricky. If they're not considered college coursework, I'm not sure. Like a right. professional development course would should would be appropriate to include in the application. For example, if you didn't receive a grade for the course, or um, if it didn't have um, a course code. Right, that's a good indication that it wouldn't be considered college coursework. So to answer your question, we're getting several responses. Um, Carly responded, not figuring out what section to put some cases in. Anne wrote, difficult to understand oh, yeah. how to interpret study abroad transcript. Amelia Wright, just deciding which courses to classify as BCPM was a challenge. And Kimberly wrote, what about a W? So when you go from there. Yeah, the W one's a really important question. So if you withdraw from a course, right, people withdraw because that means they don't get a grade. So withdrawals have zero impact on your GPA. However, if you have more than one withdrawal, you'll have to explain what happened. And usually in the secondary applications, they'll have a question about that. You know, if you have more than one withdrawal, please explain. Or, you know, if you have any withdrawals, please explain why. Um, so you can expect to get a question about that um, 
but it will have no impact on, on the GPA. Same with pass, no pass classes. Pass, no pass classes, though they're classified as pass, no pass, and there will be zero impact on your GPA for those classes. So the most common issues I've seen, um, right, is people not reviewing what they've entered, and like someone mentioned, having a lot of silly mistakes. Um, the most common issue is um, classifying courses. So you do want to make sure that you carefully check the classification so that your science GPA is accurately, um, accurately calculated. So the science GPA for AMCAS is the BCPM, so any biology, chemistry, physics, or mathematics courses. Now for ACOMAS, the, the DO application, they don't include math in the science GPA. Um, so that's an interesting um, um, thing to note. So how do you determine whether classes are BCPM? or part of your science GPA. Um, you can review the course description. If there's enough of a focus on biology, chemistry, physics, or mathematics, um, you want to include those as BCPM. You can always ask advisors like me or your pre-health advisor on campus when you're in doubt. Um, and third, you can always contact the AAMC. Um, if you call them, right, it's pretty quick to get your question answered if it's not super busy. Otherwise, you know, you can be on hold for a while, or they, I think they're doing callbacks now, which is nice. Um, but they will, you know, ask for your AMCAS ID, your name, and all of that information. Um, so just expect to have that ready, your AMCAS ID, for example. Um, next, we're going to talk about school selection. So for those of you who are reapplicants, how many schools did you apply to? In the chat window, please. 10, 4, 12, <laughs> 16, 22, 10, 10. I guess we should go on. Not yeah, enough. Somebody four. else just okay, wrote not is. enough. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so four is brave. Like, that's really brave. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. And I would say even like 10 is, is too little. Um, I recommend applying anywhere from 20 to 25 if you have the stamina or you have you can afford more. Yeah, okay. exactly. Or you've pre-written your secondary applications, you could apply to more. But you want to be careful, right? You don't want to apply to 50, 60 schools and then not be able to return the secondaries, right? So make sure you know you, you only apply to as many schools as you can. Um, respond to all of the secondary applications and possibly attend the interviews. So if applicable, right, you can apply for the FAP, the Fee Assistance Program, on the double AMC website. This includes a reduced fee for the MCAT exam. It's like 50% off. Um, you get to apply to 16 schools for free. The application fee is waived. Um, it might be 17 this year. I think that was last year's number. They also, if you let the schools know, um, that you received the FAP, um, they may also waive their secondary application fee. So that's a really good thing to know. So it costs you a lot less to apply. When you're selecting schools, you want to evaluate your stats and compare to the medical schools. And you want to look at your cumulative GPA, science GPA, and MCAT scores, right? And you want to look at the schools' um, ranges to see where you fit. Um, and we're going to have a whole webinar focused on applying with low scores, um, if that applies to you, and we're going to go into a lot more detail with strategies on how to choose schools, especially if you're applying with low scores. Um, attending pre-med conferences, um, probably virtually now, <laughs> to network with other students, medical students and medical school outreach officers, also visiting medical schools virtually. Um, I'm sure a lot of the med schools, if they don't already have virtual tours of their campus, they're probably quickly working to set those up. Also, researching schools that specialize in your research interests or fields of interest. I've also had students who've had mentors who are, were alumni of certain medical school programs um, apply to those programs and then mention their mentor in secondary applications, not the primary, um, and that has been helpful. Um, so moving on, we're, next we're going to talk about the 
basic information or biographic information section. And you're probably wondering, like, why are we spending any time on this part of the application? I know how to spell my name, right? <laughs> right? Like, let's hope. <laughs> um, so this section of the application is so easy that it could be considered a piece of cake. That's absolutely true. And there's a lovely cake on the screen. Um, that being said, most people don't double check and can make really, really, really silly mistakes. Um, and I have had a student misspell their name <laughs> on an application. Um, so I think one of the most poignant stories I have about this is a student once calling me in an absolute panic because he had listed the wrong birthplace. Um, and he was worried the WMC would flag his information. But in fact, he listed not just the wrong birthplace, but the wrong country. <laughs> oh so. Right. If you do that, the question of your citizenship could come up. If you put the wrong country, they might think you're not a U.S. citizen, <laughs> right? And if you don't fill out the visa and the credit card or the green card information, right, um, they could easily think, oh, this person might not be a citizen. We can't even, <laughs> right, like accept them. So, and it's really, 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 really hard to get the WMC to make any changes to an application. It's like near impossible. And it would take a lot of time to fix it, and it would be it would put your application behind where it originally was. So to avoid that, take your time, double check all of your personal and basic information before submitting the application. Um, it sounds silly, but make sure you spell your name right. Um, make sure that everything is accurate. And remember, slow and steady wins the race, right? I've never heard somebody complain or get upset because they did something too slowly, right? Unless you miss the application cycle, then that's a problem, <laughs> right? But you don't want to go that slow. But slow and steady wins the race. Take your time. Do a little bit every day. Right? You'll be so glad that you did. It, you will have so much less stress. So this is my favorite part of the webinar, and probably yours too, right, Linda? Mm -hmm. um, we want to know, what are some of the most embarrassing or worst mistakes that you have made when rushing oh, during the application process? In the chat window. <laughs> and this is anonymous, so don't hold back. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Nobody wants to say. We're really very friendly here. <laughs> I wouldn't say it's my favorite. My favorite is a little bit later on. Um, Okay, what if you for those of you who applied, did any of you make any uh, embarrassing mistakes? Now somebody said they already that they um, I edited my personal state so many times I had other people edit it, but still misspelled the word with. Oh no! Yeah, I still misspelled regularly there, there, and there. I mean, I know the difference. I know which is correct, but sometimes if I'm <laughs> rushing, the wrong one comes out. I always misspell the word, word website. I don't know why, but I do. <laughs> really? Yeah, I don't know why. Okay. Um, listed one There's university no on page one, another university on page two. Forgot to change the school names. Ouch. And secondary oh. is that, Oh, that hurts. Um, oh. Yeah. That's on secondary. Well, I so. feel for you. It's uh, when you... You know, when you take so much time and put so much effort and so much emotion into this application and then you go back and find a huge error, it is it can be devastating, depending on the size of the error. <laughs> so right. I right. feel for you. Um, the most common mistakes I've witnessed um, are listing only one form of contact information, only email or one phone number. Um, and I can say, like, from an admissions perspective, when you're super excited to call someone to invite them to interview or to accept them into your program, there is nothing more frustrating than not being able to reach them, <laughs> right? Like that is not fun. <laughs> um, not completing all sections of the application. So for example, the activity section, use all 15, please. If you only list seven, eight activities, you're leaving half of the activity section blank. So don't leave anything blank. Um, sloppy essays that don't represent applicants. I've seen many, many of those. Um, and people are actually so much more interesting when you talk with them, right? They just don't know what to talk about often or what to include in their essays. Um, 
not including contact information for work experiences or activities listed, that just looks super shady, right? Not listing your supervisors for any of your um, activities, it just looks uh, questionable. So I wouldn't recommend doing that. And letters of rec arriving late. Um, but good news for you, letters of recommendation are due with the secondary applications. So if you ask your letter writers, you know, give them a deadline um, of when you're planning to submit the primary, if you give them that deadline, okay, you're planning on submitting um, early June, give them that deadline for when you're planning on submitting the primary, the primary. By the time you get secondaries, you're going to have those letters ready to go. So set yourself up for success. Um, now we're going to talk about the timeline. So medical schools can run out of spots for interviews and acceptances, and that's why it's called a rolling admissions process for that reason. So for that reason, it's super um, important to apply early. So make sure you get your applications in early. And this year may be especially um, unique. Um, I'm thinking there's probably going to be a smaller applicant pool because um, of the lack of MCAT dates. What do you think, Linda? Yeah, I think the applicant pool is going to be a little bit smaller, and I think there's going to be a little bit more forbearance. Uh, for I think they're less likely to run out of interview spots early. Uh, and yep. there'll be, in general, a more understanding attitude on the part of medical schools that people couldn't take the MCAT in March and April and probably May. Um, so I think there, there will be a little bit of grace there. Yeah, they are listing June 28th as the earliest possible date to, to, to take right. the MCAT okay. now. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, and they're saying they're going to process them with, within two weeks instead of the typical 30. So right. yeah, so, and they're probably, I'm thinking there'll probably be a longer period of time in which they'll accept MCATs as well as people are able to take it. Um, Hopefully so they'll extend the happen. deadline, yeah. Exactly, exactly. Um, so that being said, it's still getting your application in early will give you an advantage. I think it might give you um, more so of an advantage this year than in other years. Exactly, exactly. That's what I'm thinking. So the sooner the better. I'm thinking like as soon as the application opens. Um, so get those applications ready um, and you want to quick submit as soon as you can. So I want to thank you all for your time, attention, and participation. Um, you make this webinar so much fun, so thank you. Um, and I have one last question for you. Why, what did you find most useful during this presentation? So what did you find most useful during this presentation? In the chat. You're getting thank yous, by the way. Um, what, did you, what did you find most insightful and most useful? most valuable. The explanation of the activities every day, hearing experience of people who had applied before, activities section and personal statement advice, the personal statement tips. Um, thank you so very much. Pretty much the personal statement stuff, but I kind of already knew the rest. Thank you for doing this. Thank you. <laughs> the details regarding the sections and what to include, not include. Um, I did not know about the statement of disadvantage. Everything. This is Kimberly, brainstorming advice. Most useful was the tips and advice about the activities section, importance of the 15 activities, hearing the importance of pacing yourself, number of schools to apply to. Well, obviously, a lot of people got a lot of good things out of this. So Alicia, I'm going to also thank you. I'm going to join our, our guests in thanking you. And um, uh, I'm going to move on. Now, the overwhelming majority of you found Alicia's presentation helpful, and it certainly is. But we're going to go into the Q&A in just a few minutes, and many of you are going to have questions that are going to reflect the limitations, as your questions up until this point have, of webinars and articles and podcasts and general resources, all these resources, and we try to make them as helpful, as practical, and as actionable as we can, are for the many. They can only give you general advice and principles, the what of admissions. And let's face it, it's hard to get accepted to medical school. Um, applying, the, uh, you can see from the stats that less than half of applicants actually get in. Now that still is not, not horrible. Most, you know, a significant percentage get in. If they don't get in the first time, they'll get in the second time. 
But applying the excellent advice Alicia has provided today to your situation, your qualifications, your goals, and your experience, that's the how of applying. And that how begs for individual advising from experienced professionals like Alicia, who can guide you through the Ironman marathon that is med school admissions. And that individual advising, as you'll see in a moment, is a key factor not only in applying successfully, but also applying confidently. And that's your goal now, to apply successfully and confidently. Given the complexity of the application process and the odds, you need a guide who knows the process inside and out and who can support you through this grueling journey. You need Accepted to be your guide. Now, with an accepted consultant at your side on your team, you have access to professional expert advice. You can save time. You can apply with confidence. You can apply successfully. We survey our clients, and last year, 91% of our client respondents were accepted to medical or osteopathic medical school. In a nutshell, you get candor and objectivity combined with decades of experience in med school admissions as you go through the grueling application process. We have the admissions experts, the guides, who can mentor you through the process so that you achieve your goal of applying confidently and successfully. Former admissions directors, staff members, poke post-bac program directors like Alicia, who have been on the other side of the process and who can be your guide through the process. Here's what I recommend you do. Go to accepted.com slash primary, choose the service that's right for you, get the guidance you need for that missing how, and go from confusion to clarity and from doubts to confidence. Now, some of you may say, isn't accepted expensive? Well, so is rejection, as some of you know. Uh, our fees are clear, but the cost of projection is not quite as obvious, even though it can be significantly higher. So let's take a look at the risks of not applying with accepted, which are now on your screen. Right? You can have the cost of reapplication, which could include retaking the MCAT, depending upon when you took it for the first time, a year of earnings at a much lower level than after you earn your MD or DO degrees, and the potential even that you could have gotten into a better program, whatever that means to you, with perhaps greater lifetime opportunities and even earnings. Now, every year we work with applicants who talked to us a year earlier and decided after taking the do-it-yourself approach and getting rejected, that the second time around they wanted to work with us. Now, we're happy to work with them. They would have been better off working with us initially, and so would you. But enough from me. What do accepted clients say? Well, this is from a couple of... Alicia's clients. I'm just going to read a couple of excerpts. I'm a med student. I was offered four interviews total and was accepted to two schools. I chose to attend UCF Com in Orlando. I could not have made it through the application process without your help. Thank you for your patience and for truly caring about my success. Well, the second, second one. My experience working with Alicia was amazing. She was knowledgeable and guided me through all steps of the process. Alicia's input for my essays was invaluable. The interview prep was important because it opened my eyes to the types of questions that could be asked and really prepared me to respond to those questions in a way that could, would demonstrate my best qualities. I would highly recommend using Alicia for the application process. Now, Alicia is wonderful, skilled, absolutely talented, incredibly nice, delightful to work with, and I do work with her, I've been working with her for years now, but there's only one of her, and she does book up. I don't want you to think that we don't have other talented experts on the staff. So here is a little more feedback. Dr. Gordon was wonderful to talk to. He was very honest in a way that was constructive. He pointed out the weak points in my application and kindly explained the best way to present them, which was my biggest concern. Dr. Newman, oh, sorry, this is Dr. Rothman was incredible. We could not have asked for a better advisor to work with. He was kind, considerate, went beyond what we could have ever imagined. I'd highly recommend him to anyone looking for assistance with the process. Dr. Newman's also outstanding. Now, we'd love to help you as we help the authors of the comments you just saw and thousands of others over the last 25 years. So once again, this is what I recommend you do as a follow-up to today's webinar. You have it on your screen. And just to remind you, or those of you who came a little bit after the beginning, we're offering 10% off any non-rush med service with the code start now. This ends May 4th. This is actually going to be on the site as of tomorrow. You guys get access to it a day earlier. That means you can uh, sign up when all, or I think all the med consultants are available, including Alicia. Um, and so you have an extra day's access to the sale. Now for your questions. Now, if you have additional questions, please again, post them in the question window. We do provide services for dental school. Yes, Shelley. 
Okay, let's see, we got some great questions. Well, one is, um, let's see, there's a very good question. It was about how does somebody get the, the um, 15 free applications? You yeah, so you apply to the FAP, you apply for FAP, the Fee Assistance Program. It's on the WMC website, so you have to meet their um, criteria, which is, you know, like applying as a disadvantaged applicant, um, family income below a certain level. Um, I don't believe they share what the limits are, but they give out, they have a certain amount of, of funds to give out every year. And so um, I would apply as soon as you can. I believe it opens in December every year. Um, and you can apply and see if you are eligible for the funds. Um, it's worth a try if you, think, if you even think you might fit um, their criteria. Okay. Um, this is from a, now some of you are here anonymously. anonymously. Some of you are, are here with your names. And what I'm going to do when there is somebody who's here, I'm going to ask the question and try and unmute you so that there's follow-up or there's need for dialogue, we can have it. Okay, if you don't want to be unmuted, just manually mute yourself on your end. But this question is from an anonymous attendee. What should you include in the activities uh, section description? Should we describe what we did in the activity or should we explain what we gained from the activity? Okay, so there are four questions I recommend that you use to write your activity descriptions. Um, and actually, I've written a blog on our website, the accepted.com blog. Um, there's a blog I've written about how to write the activity descriptions that has these four questions. But the four questions are, what is the company or organization? Two, what were your responsibilities? Three, what did you learn? And four, how did you impact the community you worked with and or how did the activity impact you in your life or career goals? So for the activity descriptions that are not the most meaningful, um, you want to answer these four questions. For the activity descriptions that are for the most meaningful, you'll only want to answer the first two questions in the description and like the last two in the most meaningful essay. Great question. And we get some other questions here because there are a lot. Okay, so Elaine, I'm going to unmute you unless you don't want to, in which case you should mute yourself. And your question is, can I include the research project even though it got cut short and just include that into the description that it was cut short? How short? How, how short was it? Elaine, are you there? Uh, hello? Uh, yes. Hi, Elaine. Hi, can you guys hear me? Yes. Yes. Can you hear you well. Okay, great. Um, so I started it in March, at the beginning of March, and um, because it was going to different schools, and of course schools closed down, so it ended and got postponed until the fall. And um, that was actually, I was counting on that as, my research experience because I don't really have much research and so I don't know if whether since I did work at least a month I don't know whether to include it and mention something about COVID or I don't know if since a lot of people have been going through stuff being cut short if I it's it's like I shouldn't mention anything about it being cut short like I'm not quite sure how to address that yeah so because you did participate in the activity for one month I recommend including it and of course also mentioning, you know, that um, it was cut short because of COVID-19. Um, the good news I have for you is that research is not required by most medical schools. Um, it's nice to be able to check that box, but it's not required, you know, unless you're applying to, um, you know, UC San Diego, Stanford, you know, like there's a very small number of schools. Um, that require research. Like I know at UCSF, or UC San Diego, um, you, students have only gotten interviews there who have two years or more of research. Um, and Stanford is similar. So there are very few schools um, that require research. So the good news is, you know, you don't need to worry about that at all. Okay, but it would be okay to still include it since I did start it at least? 
Yes, yes, I would definitely include it. And, um, yeah. If I know it's going to be postponed till the fall, I know there's a part because I'm I'm actually a reapplicant. Um, in the hours, they say that we can label it until the matriculation month, which would be next year, August. Would I still, if I know it's going to go on until the fall, I guess, do I just, you know, put it through then? Like, I guess the hours would be the same thing, estimating it until. Yeah, you just put an estimate and say it's going to happen in the fall. You know, I'm so glad you asked that because, Linda, actually, believe it or not, um, I've had less success with students um, anticipating that they'll do something. It, it's yeah. far better to list what you've done in the application than to project what you think you'll do. I've had students who um, it's hurt them to project too far into the future for their activities and to think that they're going to do stuff that they don't end up doing, and then they have to explain why they didn't end up doing it. So oh, in my okay. experience, yeah, in my even, experience, Even in a better. case like this, even in a case like this, I would normally 100% agree with you, but in this case, because yeah. it was a COVID delay, you would say not to? Okay. You know what? I wouldn't. I wouldn't. Okay. Because okay. I imagine you've probably got so many other activities and things you've done, um, right? I can't imagine that adding a, like a little bit more time on one activity is going to make a significant difference, right? Yeah, yeah. It was honestly this this experience was just really to check off the research box. I had an advisor tell me that to try to look for something in research because I have I think all the other boxes are checked. It's just I it was always hard for me to find research. It, I had a better um, success finding clinical and other stuff. So um, okay. yeah, that's the only it's like to check off the research box. <laughs> Although I'm not. Yeah, going so don't don't stress about it. Yeah, okay. don't stress about it. Like it's not required by most schools. Um, oh, great. Yeah, okay. so don't worry, but definitely include it. I would just include what you've done, and maybe in the description you could say that you plan to continue. Yeah, that's but I all wouldn't. I um, that's what I would say. Is like a, as the conclusion for the activity, I would say that you plan to continue it when it resumes. Right. In yeah, when possible. Like, okay. Yeah. All right. In the, thank in the, you. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So that, we have a lot of questions here. I didn't mean to cut her off, but we do have a lot, a lot of questions. We've already run well over. Um, now there were a lot of questions about including the arts under activities. Okay. So here's one from an anonymous uh, attendee. Should we include if we play an instrument, not really in any organization, just on the side, wondering how we should incorporate our creative side into our application? Oh, there's so many ways you can do that, actually. Um, I play violin, um, and I have to say, um, there are so many ways in which your instrument or your music or your hobbies fit in. So that could be your introduction for your personal statement. Maybe the years of you've put in learning the instrument, maybe teaching the instrument um, connects to um, right, like your love of the body and learning about the body. Maybe that was your first introduction to um, learning about the potential of the body, things you can do with your hands. Um, not only can you play a beautiful symphony, you can also, right, save someone's life, um, right, the potential of the human body. So there's so many ways you could use art in the application. If you don't cover something like that in the primary application, you're always going to have secondary questions that ask you to cover something that you haven't covered in the, in the primary. So there's a couple approaches to that. So number one, you could maybe not write about your instrument in the primary and save that for your secondaries because you know you're going to get that question. Um, the other thing you could do is do something new. After you submit the primary, make sure you go out and try something new or, you know, or maybe not go out, stay home. And actually, Itzhak Perlman has a master class on violin, and it's amazing. <laughs> so yeah. um, you can stay in and learn an instrument, right? You can, um, you know, find ways to gain new activities to talk about each step of the application process. Because from the primary to secondaries, they're going to want to know what's something new that you've done since you submitted the primary. And then at the interview, they're going to want more updates, like what, you know, what else have you done since, you know, submitting the secondaries? Um, so there's lots of, lots of things you could do. Okay. Um, Naomi, I'm going to unmute you. I'm going to read your question and also unmute you. The question is about how much clinical or how many clinical hours should you have? Um, clinical hours. So 
There's no, so for example, for the PA applications, you know, schools will say, you know, we require 100, um, you know, clinical hours. Mm -hmm. Um, With medical school, it's not so um, predefined. They don't have a set number of hours like the PA application. Um, So a good good, um, amount of clinical experience would be, you know, three or more clinical experiences, and at least two of those should be longer term, meaning six months or longer. You know, a year longer is really considered long term. Okay. Um, we have a question here. Yes. Honor, can honors and awards be listed as an activity? Um, yes. So one of the classifications for activities is honors and awards. And if you've received any kind of Dean's List Honors, Scholarships, Employee of the Month, um, any kind of recognition like that, you know, or for sports, it would be like, you know, most improved um, or most valuable player. Yeah, you want to include that in your activity section, but I would include all of them together under one, you know, awards and honors. Um, If you include each award separately, that's going to eat up a lot of space. Um, And I I don't recommend doing that. Okay. Another anonymous attendee, my question is this. If I write my personal statement that ties in some personal experiences and professional experiences that convince me that psychiatry is the field I wish to pursue, I'm an older non-traditional student with previous clinical hospital work experience. Would you say that it is a bad idea to write a personal statement that way? Given that in medical school, some students tend to change their minds about what field of medicine they will enter. You know, anything is possible as long as it's done well. Don't you agree, Linda? Yeah, it's hard to be categorical. I think I would, I would yeah. say don't you know, say that you're most interested in psychiatry or at the moment that's your inclination. Don't sound rigid about it, like your, your mind is closed. Okay. Yeah. Would you, would you agree with that, Alicia? I agree. I, the most common in my experience, I've been doing this for almost 14 years now, The most common specialties I've seen students list are surgeon and pediatrician, (laughs) right? Is that, have you seen that pretty frequently? I I don't know that I've seen that, but again, I think I I can't say that, but I just, again, I'm I'm, I'm just a little uncomfortable with anybody being very categorical at this point in their training. You can express interest in a particular area of medicine, uh, a sense that that's the direction you want to go in, but don't, don't appear closed. I agree. Yeah, I think most commonly people talk about surgeon, most commonly pediatrician in my experience, but I think you can put yourself um, in a dangerous position if, as Linda's saying, you sound too committed, like you don't want to do anything, um, anything other than that specialty. No pun intended. <laughs> right, 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 right. right, yeah. right. <laughs> okay. Um, I want to thank you all attendees very much for your time, your answers, your questions, and your participation. I'd like to share a, thought, a, a story, a thought, and a question before we part. Okay, so the thought. Remember the advice Alicia has given you about authenticity and timeliness, balance and steady effort, and so much more. And yes, we are going to let you know when the recording is live. Many of you have asked about that. So if you're concerned about the personal statement and other writing required to apply successfully, not to mention the interviews and and, um, all the the anxious time spending the next year or so stressing about this marathon that you're going to undertake, remember the excellent advice Alicia has given you today. Pace yourself, go slow, steady and slow wins the race. And also remember your goal, apply successfully and confidently. And then imagine yourself at the end of the marathon in the place of the client you're going to hear from now. He had slightly low numbers and was stressed and overwhelmed when he came to us. He worked with Accepted and here's what he wrote a year after he had been sitting where you are today. I've been, th- again, I'm gonna take excerpts from it. I know that I wouldn't have had a prayer if it weren't for your substantial help. They say the essays are one of the most important aspects of the application, especially for someone like me whose numbers are a little bit low average. You greatly de-stressed an important part of this process that was making me quite anxious. I felt more confident in my essays after working with you. Now, slightly low numbers, concern about the quality and quantity of writing, 
He'll have, he, he, you'll have to do bet between the personal statement, the most meaningful experience essays, and the secondaries. If you can relate, then also realize that this client did it. He's now in medical school, and you can do it too. Take the steps he took and get accepted. Now, I also promised you a question. You've stayed for the presentation, the Q&A, even the sales pitch, and you're clearly interested in what we have to say. So the question is, and I don't care where you answer it, the question window or the chat window, what is, has, what is causing you to hesitate about engaging one-on-one -on -one with Alicia or with one of the other outstanding consultants at Accepted? Okay, one answer is money. Money is another answer. Anybody else have an answer? Finances? Okay. All right. It's expensive. Well, again, I want to point out that you're probably looking at about $3,000 if you apply to 20 schools. If you apply to 10, it's more like 1,500 in just application expenses, not counting MCAT prep. Our minimum fee is $330. Even our primary application package is less than what you're going to spend in um, in application fees. So if you have to, if you don't get accepted and you have to reapply, you are going to be spending much, much, much more than what you're going to, what you would pay us, even if you took one of our more expensive services. So it can be that applying without us is actually more expensive than applying with us. In addition, right now, as you see on the screen, you can save hundreds of dollars on our services because of the discount code that we have. So that I hope is addressing the, um, yes, your essay can be reviewed at $303 per hour. Now I can't promise you that it'll take only one hour. I mean, you can tell us there's a one hour limit, but it's depending upon the quality, it probably is a one to two hour task to, to review and edit the personal statement. We can give feedback on it in less than an hour, that's for sure. Um, that was any other any other diff issues with um, reasons that you're hesitating. Again, right now, 10% off, it's under $300. And these more expensive services, you save much, much, much more. You can pay using also PayPal, which gives you six months to pay, no no interest and no payments. You can take credit cards, obviously. Um, any other reasons you're hesitating to engage with us? To edit activity section? Sure, we'll edit the activity sections. We won't go into your portal, but we do edit. Yes, yes, Elise, we, I, I am saying that we will review and edit your essays and your activity sections for $300 per hour. And we, yes, we do edit. Can you choose whom you want to work with at the moment? Yes, everybody's available. Cert yeah, I, I can't pronounce your name, I'm sorry. But yes, you can choose whom you want to work with. Alicia is available if you would like to work with her. We also have other consultants, as I mentioned earlier. Not sure whether buy a package or try hourly. You know, what I would suggest you do, we do offer free consultations. So if you sign up for the free consultation, you can discuss with your consultant which works better for you. Mary, do you have essay drafts now or have you started on your essays? You have essays, if you have essay drafts, then you can go to the essay editing page, upload your essays and get an opinion as to whether they are a good foundation for continuing. If they are a good foundation, you're much better off with, with our hourly plans. And by the way, if you buy five or 10 hours, you will pay less than the, than the 330 per hour, less 10% discount, because it's 10% off everything. So you get 10% off the five hour plan, the 10 hour plan, um, the 10 hour plan's regular rate is 295. So if you got 10% off that, it would be less than 270 per hour for 10 hours. Okay. <clears throat> How long do you have to wait for the review and edits once you submit it? We, we provide two business day turnaround. Okay. Mary, did I answer your question? Okay, if, you're, if you have a draft, you can probably, I mean, we'll, we'll let you know if we think the, the draft isn't that good and you'd be better off with the package, but you should start with the assumption that it's a, a good foundation for continuing. 
Now, Hannah asked, what makes you different from other similar services? Why invest and accept it? Well, we've been in business for 25 years. I don't, I don't think, to my knowledge, none of the other services out there can say that. And I think that is quite a testimony to the quality of the service. Um, if you look at the people on the staff, there's Alicia, whom you've already met. Good, I'm glad, Mary. There's Alicia. Yes, yes, Alicia, that's right. First of all, the essay, then get a free consultation on the service. Mm -hmm. um, but getting back to Hannah's question, we've been in business for 25 years. There's hundreds of testimonials from satisfied clients on the site. I, I gave you just a, a taste. Um, we have former admissions directors, former post-bac program directors like Alicia, people who've served on medical school admissions committees. Some are MDs, some aren't MDs. You can choose your consultant um, or you can allow us to choose whatever you prefer. But I think the big, big, big difference is the experience on our staff, the expertise of our staff, and the dedication of our staff. Again, if you look at the testimonials, you'll see, I think, uh, that, there, that the dedication is unparalleled. Okay. Is there agreement or again, that you won't share our essays or personal statements with anyone else? We have a, per a privacy statement on our site and we do not share your essays with anyone else. As Alicia said, they have to be personal and, and individual and reflect the uniqueness that is you. Any other questions about you know, answer responses to my questions really at this point? Um, if I immigrated to the USA, my parents back home, I took me forever. Do you have an unlimited package? We have, we have, yeah, we have a, it's almost unlimited. There are some limits on it. If you go to our primary application page, which you can get to, if I don't remember that, I think it's, um, well, exhibit.com slash primary, go there and you will see on the far right of the page, our most comprehensive service. It's pretty comprehensive. It's almost unlimited, not quite. Final application. Okay, so Dee Dee asked, what about the application final check? How does it work? Final application check, somebody like Alicia would take your, let's say, primary application and review it on a content level. It would not include editing and correcting. It would basically Can be... Can I answer this question, Linda? Sure, go for it. Thank yeah, you. so what you, you do is... It. Yeah, what you do is you would generate a PDF of the application, and you can do that before you click, click Submit. And then what we would do is, you know, I review that before you submit it, and you would not believe the number of errors I find <laughs> every single time. So it, it's a review before you click Submit of everything actually entered into the application. And should, we, should I answer Lisa's question as well? Hello? Linda? Yes, yes. Lisa, oh, you're there? Okay, yeah, sorry. Yeah, do you hear me? Hello? Yeah, out. Should I answer uh, Lisa's question as well? I, I think my... Sure, go yeah. ahead. The question so, Lisa, is... Lisa, it sounds... Um, it, let me just read it because nobody else can see it, but you and me, I think. Yeah, sure. Wait, can you guys sure. raise your hand if you can see the chat box? I can I see it. <laughs> uh, Am I wrong? We recently switched to Zoom. Oh, you can see it. All right. So there's no need to, yeah, you can just answer it. Go ahead. I should know this with all these. Okay, Zoom cool. So, um, super fun, complicated question. Uh, thank you for sharing it, Lisa. Um, if the only form of disadvantage is immigrating, I wouldn't um, use that. However, if immigrating, if you immigrated to the U.S. and that presented extreme hardships, like if you, um, you know, worked four jobs to make ends meet, if you struggled, you know, if you didn't have access to health care, um, if there were multiple forms of disadvantage involved, then it would be appropriate to apply as disadvantaged. Does that answer your question? That was for Lisa. Are you there, Lisa? Did it work? Kind of, kind of. I guess. Yeah, well, I would say I would need more information to answer it. Um, really so if well. you want to schedule a consultation, contact me, and I'd be more than happy, um, you know, to answer it in more detail. Okay. Here's another uh, question. I have not completed any volunteering in years. I've been working full-time and military part-time. Is there a way to work around this? Um, that's tricky. Uh, what, what do you think, Linda? 
Well, I mean, military service, while it is paid, it's also serving the community. I think I would also strongly, is, is, your, is your work clinical in nature? Yes. All right, so you have plenty of clinical exposure. I still think if you can get some volunteer activity in, it would, it would be, it'd be wise to do it. There's certainly and, plenty of opportunities now with the whole COVID situation. Um, and I agree. I agree with what you're saying, Linda. I would say my dad's a retired colonel in the Air Force, so thank you for your service, and I grew up in the military, so yes. I'm super familiar with um, the military experience. But if, you know, my dad used to help people fix their cars, and he ended up um, winning, like, an award. They gave him a golden wrench for being the person in the, wherever we lived on the military base, is the go-to person to fix their cars. And he did that in his free time um, just because he's an awesome person. So I would say, is there anything like that that you do? Are there ways that you, like, tutor kids in the neighborhood? Do you fix other people's cars? Things like that matter. So it doesn't have to be a formal volunteer experience that you sign up for. It could even just be things that you do every day or every week to help ev the people around you. Well, um, he says, I mentor people on my free time. In the, in the chat yeah, room. okay. Yeah, there you go. That's perfect. Yeah. yeah. And I'm sure, like, you're military. Like, that's what military people do is you help everyone. That's awesome. Um, actually, I meant to send this to everybody. Hold on a second. Sending out this to everybody. There you go. Okay. Um, I think at this point, you've done a really good job of answering my question. I appreciate that. Um, great. Great. And wonderful. Again, I'm, I'm a, I. Let, I'll, I'll let you, you tell Alicia how to pronounce your name. I'm not going to embarrass myself by trying to do it. But um, we've really enjoyed talking to you this evening. Thank you so much for all the positive feedback you've sent our way. It's, we really appreciate it. And thank you for uh, your questions, your answers, your participation, um, and your time. Have a very, I wish very, you all yeah. go ahead. Sorry, Linda. Have a very, <laughs> very good evening. And I'm going to join Alicia in what she's about to say. I wish you all success. Whatever you decide to do, I wish you all success. Take care.